warm welcome to Conference Conversations, an interactive online talk show where we discuss key issues and questions related to the work of the Conference on the Future of Europe on a regular basis. These conversations are organized under the auspices of the Conference Observatory, a joint initiative by the Bertelsmann Stiftung, the European Policy Center, the King Baudouin Foundation, and the Stiftung Mercator, which aims to observe, critically analyze, and inspire the deliberations of the conference, and also to develop proposals to improve the EU's future participatory and democratic architecture. My name is Jackie Davis. As always, I have the privilege of moderating our discussion today, a totally interactive debate. And with me today to talk about the European Citizens Panels and the Future of Democracy in the European Union are George Pagulados, Director General of the Hellenic Foundation for European and Foreign Policy, Eliamep. He's a member of the conference plenary and also of the conference observatory's high level advisory group which is currently working on its first report uh, on the conference we also have with us elisa lironi senior manager for european democracy at the European Citizens Action Service, and Johannes Groibel, policy analyst at the European Policy Centre, and Karina Stratelat, senior policy analyst and head of the EPC's Politics and Institutions Programme. Very warm well welcome to you all. Quick housekeeping before we start. As I said, totally interactive. Really want to hear from all of you. You can, if you want to intervene, either click on the raised hands buttons. Uh, and when I allow you to talk, I will ask you to unmute yourself. No need to put your camera on. We'll make it swift and efficient just by using microphones. Uh, if you want to write your question, uh, please do so in the Q&A box, uh, but please keep it as brief as possible. Twitter length or less would be terrific. Uh, the Twitter hashtag, if you would like to share what you are hearing in this discussion is conference conversations or of course you can use the future of europe hashtag or the c-o-f-o-e but please do use conference conversations so corinna just to get us started and before i turn to our guests just give me a sense of where we are uh, what's been happening since the last conference conversations thank you very much jackie and um, good morning to everyone among the uh, most recent developments is that the COVID-19 pandemic has pushed back the timeline of the conference with two planned events postponed until the next year now. Uh, more specifically, the third and final session of the first panel dealing with socioeconomic issues and digital transformation, uh, which was initially uh, scheduled for the beginning of December uh, in person in Dublin. Um, as well as the third conference plenary foreseen uh, to take place on the 19th of December, were both rescheduled. However, the third and final session of the second panel dealing with European democracy uh, did go ahead in person this past weekend in beautiful Florence, Italy, hosted by the European University Institute. As such, we now have one European citizens panel that has completed its activities and, and produced recommendations. The 20 citizens ambassadors from this panel will, will meet with the relevant working groups of the conference plenary online on 18th December, and will also present their 39 recommendations to the conference plenary in January. So the conference process has advanced, but not without some hiccups. Okay this time mm -hmm. pandemic related hiccups. let's talk later about those hiccups and what they might mean because of course the timing for the conference on the future of europe was already very tight without these delays so it'd be interesting to get your thoughts on what these delays might mean whether there might be an extension uh, but thank you for that i want to turn first uh to george and to elisa really to get a sense before we delve into what's been happening what those recommendations that have been developed contain a sense of, of your feeling about where we are so far Far. George, what is your overall assessment of how the conference is going? And have there been for you any surprises, either positive or negative? Well, uh, Jackie, this is the perfect example where you have a, a great initial idea to involve citizens on how the future of Europe should be shaped. And then the implementation of this idea inevitably is fraught with obstacles. The main obstacle being that the mobilization that you would like to see on the part of the citizens is not exactly what happens on the ground because it takes time to build visibility for the conference. So, you know, in a way, this is a paradise for cynics who rush to say uh, this whole process is a 
uh, a failure or whatever. I think this is a very unfair assessment, uh, despite all the organizational hiccups that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, it is important that the citizens panels are substantial, that they are producing results. Um, this remains a, an historic opportunity of, of great symbolical importance that could become very substantial if the joint presidency decides to follow up on some of the findings and the proposals. Now, uh, I, I think that there is ground to be optimistic with regard to the participation and the visibility, which will be growing. The platform is getting more visits and more comments. I was uh, positively surprised by the mobilization and the degree of engagement of citizens who were engaged in the citizen panels. They devoted the time, they showed passion and commitment, they prepared um, for non-professional -pol non politicians. The, their degree of preparation and commitment was uh, quite remarkable in many cases. I was negatively surprised, if I can put it this way, by what I see as a rift between citizens and politicians, at least in the mind of some citizens, politicians are not really engaging, they're not really listening. Um, they uh, believe, some of the citizens believe that the politicians are sort of manipulating the process. I think this is to, a, to some extent uh, justified because the, the time of exposure is very limited, um, but it is also quite dangerous if um, citizens end up developing this view that politicians are a self-serving class mm -hmm. because democracy requires participation of citizens, but it also relies on politicians. Absolutely. And this well, is an exercise that should not put aside um, the institutions and the functions of representative democracy. And indeed, up until now in conference conversations, we've tended to talk about whether those feelings would be endangered by the result. Uh, so if they were ignored, the recommendations, you're saying the process itself is beginning to stir up some of those feelings. Uh, I want to ask you later if uh, you have any thoughts on, on how those feelings can be assuaged, whether you expect any changes in the way the conference is working. But Elisa, let's get your overall impression first. So George said, it's a paradise for cynics, but that's not unfair. This is historic. Uh, he did put an if, if leaders uh, listen. Uh, but for you, have you been pleasantly surprised? Are there any negatives so far? Well, thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, uh, I'm, unfortunately, I am a, just a bit more cynical and more pessimistic than George, um, but I can absolutely tell you where I'm coming from. So first of all, ICAS is also part of the Civil Society Convention um, in which we're part of the steering committee. So um, we've managed to see things also from a civil society perspective. Then I've had also the honor to be uh, appointed as one of the citizens uh, panels expert on digital transformation that happened in November. And I was also a close collaborator of um, one of the uh, steering committee members of the civil society convention in the plenary session of the conference on the future of Europe in Strasbourg. So I managed to see through my eyes also a bit what was happening behind the scenes. And I have to say that I'm very pessimistic just without going too much into detail. I just wanted to tell you my experience in the citizen panel as an expert there have been not just a few hiccups. There were very many serious hiccups on the process itself. And now while everyone is always speaking about the impact of the contributions, which was something I thought would have always been a challenge of the conference on the future of Europe, now I am starting to question the legitimacy of the process in order to receive this impact in a transparent and democratic way. What's your Before biggest concern? What has prompted this concern? My concern is the process on how these working groups are, are going on in the, in the plenary sessions, how the plenary sessions of the Conference of the Future of Europe continue being a sequence of speeches instead of a real debate on citizens' issues and on the fact that in the citizens' panel, there have been hiccups for me, for example, not knowing how these experts were selected, so a transparency issue. Um, the preparations of the experts, including myself, we received only information at 7 p.m. the night before we were about to be experts the next day, okay. which I do not think is a normal thing. And while I was giving my uh, presentation, which was already 
ambitious on six different topics of digitalization. Actually, they had sent some citizens the wrong link to my session and they were meant to leave okay. because they couldn't understand anything I was saying because okay. interpretation was missing. Okay, Elisa, we'll come back on some of these more detailed points, but a, a, a certain amount of chaos, it would sound like. Uh, and, I've, and these criticisms, of course, also being expressed, the working groups and how they're operating. Lots of concerns being expressed. Want to come back on that shortly. But Johannes, can you just give us a sense? 39 proposals made it through uh, from the citizens panel um, on European democracy, values and rights, rule of law and security. Seems quite a, a mixed bag. Uh, ranges all the way from sort of, I don't know, discrimination in the labour market to animal welfare through to citizen. Um, can you make any sense of it for us? Yeah, thanks, Jackie. Um, sure, and um, you already mentioned that we've seen a remarkable breadth of, of proposals um, coming from this uh, second panel. Um, so I won't even try to, to summarize all of them um, uh, in a comprehensive manner, but um, I want to highlight some of the proposals that I found interesting, um, but also give some more uh, general observations of, of the nature of the proposals that we we, we see it. So as you see, uh, as you said, um, the, the panel elaborated in total um, 42 recommendations, nine, uh, 39 of these were adopted in the end, three um, did not uh, meet the 70% threshold um, that the panel set um, for the voting procedure. Um, and um, yeah, the 39 recommendations can be clustered around the five streams of the panel, panel which is um, ensuring rights and non-discrimination, protecting democracy and the rule of law, reforming the EU, um, building European identity, and strengthening citizens' participation. And as you already mentioned, uh, given that these streams are rather broad and go into different directions, also, also uh, the breadth of the proposals is, is relatively um, uh, yeah, comprehensive. Um, we can see in general that citizens were asking for more competences to the European level, for a bigger role of the European Union. Um, and uh, on the other hand, we can see that um, the depth and also the nature of the recommendations are very different from each other. Um, we have on the one hand some recommendations that had very specific Mm. Um, asks um, on uh, changing a specific directive or a specific regulation, um, whereas others um, are very broad and rather outline um, a goal rather than um, uh, a specific action. Thank you very much. And interesting to get your thoughts on whether having so many and such a variety, both in terms of the style of them and the content, uh, is, is the best way to... to maximize the impact of these panels. Um, I saw some Twitter tweeting, not least by your colleague, Yanis Emanuridi, saying, yes, there's more, less should be more, uh, and they need to be more focused and concentrated. Be interested to get your views. But Corinna, you were in Florence. You watched the process. Um, I know we've already heard from George and from Elisa some of the concerns that the process has aroused, but how did they get to, in, in practical terms, how did it work? Uh, and then we can talk about the concerns. Yes, so as in all previous um, sessions, the process was um, basically organized as a succession of, um, of, of plenary and subgroup discussions, and, and of course relied on expert input, professional facilitation, and, um, and simultaneous interpretation. The first day uh, in Florence, citizens were asked to identify their preferences among, the, among all of the so-called orientations, which they had defined in the previous session. Then they, were, they went into their subgroups and were asked to formulate recommendations for the top rated orientations uh, in their own substream. Representatives from each of the subgroups then got the, the chance during the second day to, to visit with other subgroups and collect feedback uh, on their draft recommendations before finalizing them. And then, of course, the full list of 42 recommendations from all subgroups 
was was compiled and it was read out uh, in plenary the final day and where citizens voted on every single proposal one at a time so this is the process in a nutshell, but of course, as you can imagine, it sounds a lot uh, smoother and, and much more effective than, than it, it actually was. In essence, there are criticisms, we'll come to those in a minute, we've already heard some of them. Does it work in basic terms? Do we have a model here that works? Um, I mean, I don't know if we have a model that uh, can and should be uh, reproduced uh, in, uh, infinitely in the future, but it, it's a model that can work. It didn't quite work as well as it could have this during the this Florence session, uh, but 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 it's a model that has potential to work. Let's, uh, well, let's why didn't it, just to pick up on that point. Why didn't it work as well as it could have? Sorry. From your perspective, why didn't it work as well as it could have? Okay, well, um, the, the, there were the problems associated with the very broad teams and, and the very limited time available. Uh, these were still present in this session, as in all previous sessions, but I won't dwell on those. Uh, however, there were also session-specific problems that manifested this time. Uh, these were mostly visible during the first day, which, which I would define as, as rather chaotic and frustrating. Uh, to choose their preferred orientations, which the organizers printed out uh, and posted on the walls of the church uh, at the Institute in Florence, citizens were asked to assign colorful stickers, oh, yes. uh, but the explanations on how exactly to use these stickers were not at all clear. I myself as observer had to seek clarifications from the organizer after the first plenary in order to understand how okay. the system worked. So we're getting a sense of some of those. Add that to Elisa's uh, picture of not knowing how experts are selected, not getting the right information, a certain amount of chaos. Now, George, I mean, some of that, as you say, um, is inevitable this is a new process it's still having some teething difficulties but you pointed to a larger problem uh when you said citizens have the impression that the politicians are, all, are not really listening and maybe manipulating the process why do you think those concerns have arisen and, and is this do you think as a as a member of the plenary is this being taken on board are people looking at, at ways to address this well, the plenary <clears throat> is the main forum where citizen representatives uh, are in touch with, with politicians, because that's where uh, Euro parliamentarians and national parliamentarians and council members are also present and participate. I would say the plenary is the weakest link of the whole process. The idea of three minute speeches just doesn't work. It's a, it's a sequence of monologues that do not react to each other. There are issues that are raised and then there's no follow up. Uh, a lot of time has been wasted in the first two plenaries, people still making introductory speeches or speeches about how important it is to speak or speeches of politicians extolling the virtues of citizens or just citizens complaining uh, they were not being heard instead of at least using this five minutes opportunity to, to say something substantial. Um, and of course, the lack of specific agenda is a serious shortcoming. Um, and I hope that this would be corrected as we move on. And uh, indeed, Florence is an example of how you can run substantial um, citizens' panels upon an agenda with guiding questions and with a moderation that makes sense. Now, that said, the quality of the presidency in the plenaries uh, and in the working groups as well can make a huge difference. And some of the presidents in the plenary and in the working groups uh, have provided very poor presidency. Uh, some of them systematically mispronouncing names, for instance, and that's that's the very basic important. thing. Very it, basic. It, it affects the whole the whole yeah. process. Um, and and in an effort not to appear to be manipulating the um, agenda of the plenary, the organizers have left it to be free for all. I think this was a mistake because a lot of time has been wasted, things being repeated, and there's no build up of experience. There's no build up of any sort of dialogue. Um, and even the opportunity to react to comments is very limited. And especially citizens who are not experienced in the two-hand uh, procedure have not used this, this, uh, this opportunity. Um, I think that a lot could be done with more active presidency, with more specific agenda, and with the ability to follow up. And a lot can be done in the working groups, which so far have not worked. Information comes in very late. 
Uh, I agree with Elisa, very serious organizational mishaps, uh, a lot of confusion. Uh, again, very delayed process in terms of how citizens can have sufficient time to elaborate their intervention. Mm -hmm. After all, they do not come with uh, you know, armies of uh, assistance as, as politicians do. And they need to be able to be prepared. They need to be able to be briefed on issues. Uh, many of these items are quite confusing uh, in terms of not knowing what is in the treaties, in terms of not knowing how policies are actually exercised and what needs to be done uh, to yeah. affect policy change. All this should be more clearly explained uh, in the citizen panels and especially in the working groups if something uh, is to be done. So yeah. far, I, I would say that nothing substantial or very little substantial results have come out of the working groups uh, from my own experience. And I think this is a shame because we are we're already in the middle of the process. However, I hope that they will be an acceleration and a build up of experience as we move on to, towards uh, towards come progress. back on that if we might of course working groups as Corinna mentioned earlier meeting uh, this weekend uh, and we'll see whether there is they have learned anything from the process so far Johannes you want to come in and then I want to come back to Elisa on can we fix this and if so how yeah and just uh, very quickly to respond to George because um, I think um, yes there are, there were these uh, problems with the working groups and with the plenary but at the same time. Um, the, the problems that George described uh, don't come as a surprise because um, exactly in those points where we're witnessing all those problems at the moment, these were exactly the issues that in the beginning of the process, the institutions could not agree on how to move forward and then as a result um, left, uh, left the issue blank. Um, we, uh, the best example for this is indeed uh, the working groups where, where the executive board couldn't agree on a methodology and, and um, a way how to conduct these, these, these working group meetings. And that is why we now have these uh, sometimes um, yeah, chaotic uh, situations um, where neither politicians nor citizens are, are convinced um, and satisfied with the process so far. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So because they couldn't agree, because it was so laborious, in a sense, they built this element of failure into the process from the start. And you can't blame the groups themselves uh, for what's going wrong. Would you agree with that, Elisa? It is to do with really not being clear about some of the roles here. Uh, and do you see a way of, of fixing some of these problems as we move forward? I mean, you have yet to have your, your group have yet to have their third session, the finalizing the recommendations. Can we learn from this? Can the organizers fix this? I completely agree with what Yanis just said. This, the process needs to be solid and clear and transparent since the beginning when we start a certain process, not in the middle of it. So if you ask me if it is possible to fix a process, which for me already started out as broken, it is very hard to do. But of course, I can give some recommendations of what I think that at the moment we could improve. For example, in the working groups, the presidents need to just take that leadership position and need to have a structure on how they think the deliberations will then bring to a certain contribution um, at the EU level. And as I said, the experience I've had is that seeing these working groups in which it was, again, a sequence of speeches from the citizens and the stakeholders and experts which were in the group. This is not a place for institutional actors to pronounce their preferences or uh, organizations to say their preferences. The whole point of this exercise is to make sure that citizens can contribute to policy making and to what they want in the future of Europe. So the citizens idea should have been taken much more strongly and debated about in uh, these processes. And let's say that democracy is all about discussions. It's about deliberation. It's about talking to each other, even if uh, those ideas do not represent the ideas that you have. And I think that there are three main points that could be improved because this is where I see a lack. It's the transparency of the process itself to the citizens, meaning how are the experts chosen? This needs to be explained much better. How are the citizens chosen? And I know that they've been doing reports on uh, the random representative sample, which is absolutely great, but it just has to be communicated much better. The second point goes really to communication. 
I think that there is a huge lack of communications about, around the Conference on the Future of Europe in the member states. And I kind of blame it also on the member states themselves. I have been asking my own family and friends that I know just to have a feel of if they knew anything about the Conference of the Future of Europe. And of course it's no. It seems like it's again a Brussels-based exercise, which shouldn't be the case. It is a pity that such a big transnational deliberation process and participatory process is just not known to citizens, which questions once again its legitimacy. How can citizens think that this is a legitimate process if they don't even know that this is existing since the yeah. beginning? I think that's the point. And the third is around the methodology. And I don't think, uh, um, I mean, I know, Jackie, you said that this is a new process. But that it is, at the same time, I do not think this is a new process. There are so many experts out there since decades, including myself, we have been implementing this yeah. type of processes, maybe in a smaller scale. And I give the fact that it is a big challenge to do it in 27 member states, et cetera. But I don't think these processes are new and there are so many lessons learned. And the methodology on how we ask the citizens as well, the questions that we ask the citizens, according to me, they're not done also in the right way because uh, um, citizens are quite clueless. I also feel like the fact of, that we change citizens from one um, citizen panel to another may also be possibly not the right way to do things because that means that the new citizens have to learn what happened in the, um, in the previous citizen panel. Um, but there are many things around the methodology that I would also think. And as you say, there is expertise out there, a lot of experience, just not in doing it in this form, but things that could be learned from. Corinna, you wanted to come back in and then I'm going to take a couple of audience questions yeah. and move to where we go from here in terms of uh, the content itself uh, and the future. Corinna. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, to emphasize that there, however, in my opinion, two categories of, 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 of recommendations, let's say, to be made. One refers to, to, to the process in, or to the initiative in general and to more structural issues like the, the scope of the issues selected and the time uh, available for, for the process, but also for citizens to, to, to become more aware and knowledgeable about the issues on which they're being asked to, uh, to, to pass judgment and to give opinions and recommendations. So those um, are, are of a more fundamental nature and are not really possible to change anymore at this stage. We cannot go back and uh, uh, narrow the topics uh, or we cannot go back and give more time necessarily. But what we can do is deal with some of the practical um, issues. And for example, regarding the, the last session of these panels and, and uh, uh, the lessons learned from Florence, I mean, a lot more can be, do, can be done to, to make the first day a more pleasant and and productive experience. For instance, better communicating with citizens about what they have to do, better explanations, uh, taking the time to for them to even practice, uh, ensuring that Wi-Fi covers uh, uh, all of the technical, uh, technical um, instruments in the room and allow all citizens and all other participants, including observers, to understand what's going on. Things, I mean- the very um, basic the, things. The basic things can be fixed. Huh? And I think the organizers will, and and I hope they will um, adjust such issues for the next um, for the next sessions for the next panels. And then, of course, there is one other thing which has come up among the observers, and I think it's a very good idea and can still be implemented, which is to say that maybe we should have another session once the working groups finalize their work, in which these recommendations that come out from the exchange with the uh, stakeholders and politicians. Uh, return to citizens and citizens reflect once again on the recommendations that they put forward because citizens have produced these recommendations without uh, a proper expertise and without yeah. enough time to digest the expertise they received. So now through the interaction and feedback they receive from the politicians, they could have another chance but that to would, uh, reflect yeah, the recommendations. A good idea, but that brings me, uh, Johannes, and then I want to come back to you, George, on whether you think changes will be made. But yeah, Johannes, if they were to introduce this other element, and we talked earlier about the delays uh, to uh, one of the citizens' panels in particular that was supposed to meet in Dublin at the beginning of the month, the conference plenary that is not now happening and has moved uh, to January. I mean, 
can we stick the timetable for this conference was always very tight because it took so long to get it up and running we now have these delays we have suggestions that we may need additional elements to make the process work do you foresee changes to the overall timetable or is that because of french presidency concerns or other issues pretty much set in stone how the impact of having to be hybrid again and all these delays how do you see it you're muted at the moment. Sorry. Um, we uh, definitely have uh, some uncertainty uh, with respect to the, the overall timeline, but I think what we can uh, pretty surely say at this point is that there will be delays um, uh, of the overall process. Um, this is, of course, connected to, uh, to the delays we already had, the postponements um, of the uh, panel in Dublin, of the conference plenary, um, which means that um, also, yeah, the rest of the process with, with, will move further down the line, including meaning that uh, the plenary will, for the first time, be able to uh, discuss um, its overall recommendations um, in, in, in mid-March uh, instead of um, mid-February, as it was planned. Um, and that doesn't even figure in um, uh, potential delays that might come in um, uh, during January, because we don't know how the, the COVID situation will uh, will develop in, in January. And, uh, but, but there is another problem, which is connected um, to, uh, to the French presidency, which means that if the, the process drags on so far, uh, so, so long, um, also the French election will come into, uh, into the way. And we already have indications um, of, of uh, the French government and from Macron that they won't be eager to significantly intervene before the elections, which means that the final outcome will inevitably move past its election. And, and um, so that we are in the end will have an outcome probably at the earliest in, in May. Thank you very much. George, in terms of, uh, and in order to avoid this, as you said earlier at the beginning, avoid this remaining a cynic's paradise, uh, because you pointed out such a historic opportunity. Do you see, as a, as a plenary member, uh, an appetite for visit, revisiting some of these issues about the way the process is running, some of these issues about the way the plenaries are running, which you've described as the weakest uh, point because of the format, because of the structure. Do you think these things are being taken on board? that we might see some changes or is this more going to be in the nature of lessons for and we'll come to whether you think this is going to be something that's taken into the future lessons for another round of this sort of thing and can they fix some of this now uh, i think there's not much to, to to improve substantially in the plenaries because that's where a large number of representatives uh, accumulate and inevitably the time left is very limited so you end up with these three minute and two minute uh, uh, debates, which are not actually debates. Uh, where a lot can change is in the working groups and the process of involving citizens and how to formulate and reformulate the proposals of the citizens. And as, as Corina said, for example, go back to the citizens after their proposals have been formulated by, uh, by the politicians, by the elected representatives and institutions. Um, I think that what is becoming clear is that more time is needed and uh, the French uh, presidential elections are um, helping in prolonging the process. Uh, more time is needed also in order to make this whole process visible. Every day that passes, more people are added to the platform, more people learn about it. It's, it, it, it's very slow still, but it is growing and interest is increasing and it is becoming more visible. Uh, as Elisa said, what happens in the member states is, is vital because that's where this whole process is supposed to work. Uh, public spheres in the European democracy are mainly national and that's where citizens need to be mobilized even if they are to be mobilized for the European public sphere. They have to be mobilized at the national level so as to contribute to the European public sphere. Uh, so I think it is becoming clear that more time is needed uh, I, I'm quite certain that the process will be prolonged. Uh, also, if France uh, and, and the presidency is willing to have a substantial contribution, it will have to go after the, the French presidential elections. And then uh, I, there is also a growing understanding that this should become, or at least some elements of it, should become permanent features mm. uh, of the way in which decisions are taken. So more 
uh, deliberation on the part of the citizens, more participation on the part of the citizens should be added to uh, the way in which European representative institutions function. Let's, let's talk in a moment about whether you think that will actually happen. Um, I want to take, and also, by the way, of course, many of those proposals from this panel were precisely about that, calls for in exceptional circumstances, legally binding referenda, EU-wide referenda calls for permanent bodies of citizens, for citizens assemblies that would be mandatory. Take a few questions from our audience and then we'll come back and talk about what you think will happen with these recommendations and where we go from here. Uh, Anya Verkamp, and this really I think is to you, Elisa, do you think the future of Europe process could have been better could have better included civil society from the beginning of the development. And Anya asked another question about, and it links to what we were just saying, would it be possible for decisions of future citizens' assemblies to be legally binding or have more legal weight that would demand a deliberate response from the institution? So that takes us into the territory of what happens to these recommendations. But the role of civil society, and you mentioned the civil society convention, Lisa, set up partly because of a concern that you didn't have a big enough role. Yes, exactly. That's exactly how it went. Um, uh, so um, I definitely think that uh, the institutions should have at least listened to us in taking into consideration civil society uh, since the very start of the process and not only because we at a certain point created the convention to uh, fill in this lack of uh, the fact that uh, they were actually uh, taking us on board in the process. Um, I have to say that if there is one thing that surprised me about this whole conference on the future of Europe is how civil society actually stuck together for once and managed to create such a big coalition of around 90 uh, different members in this uh, convention. And I have to say that it is working very well. We have different uh, diff clusters around these uh, topics and we actually managed to get um, together with the European movement, international and others, eight seats of civil society organizations in uh, the plenary. Now, my problem is this, that when we were in Strasbourg, there are nine working groups. And of course, with only eight seats, it is impossible for us to be in all nine of them. And then this is another little hiccup, let's say, mm -hmm. of the process, because it would have been nice to be in all of the working groups on all of the topics and be represented there. But every time we need to also decide which one we're going to sacrifice, um, which I don't think is very good. So in the beginning of the process, from what I know, is that uh, there were certain MEPs who really kind of fought for civil society to be on board. Now, as we know, this process is not only made of uh, members of the European Parliament and the European Parliament as an institution, it's made of different um, institutions and there always has to be an agreement there always has to be a compromise so definitely civil society organizations could have been on board and should have been on board especially in the making of the process I always go back to it and uh, on the impact from my point of view I do think that it is going to be very very difficult to see any sort of impact from these citizens panels from these citizens contribution I am very very scared that this will end up uh, once again, uh, as we've seen in the past with different other processes, that citizens' contribution will be brushed away. Um, there can be many, many reasons for which they are brushed away. For example, okay, citizens' contributions are very interesting, but uh, we already are working on this in the European Union. This is something that I've heard so, so many yeah. times, like, thank you, but we're already working on that. That's it. Or Thank you, but this requires the revision of the treaty. We're not there yet. Thank you very much. That's it. Yeah. I've heard this so many times in other sorts of uh, um, participatory democracy uh, processes around the Europe. Thank you. At least brief, briefly, at least lots of questions coming in. Sorry. Yeah, so I think that uh, the, pr the whole problem is that having a solid process is the precondition of having a meaningful impact, yeah. which is the, the transparent and democratic. And since we don't have that solid process, we're still yeah, yeah. figuring out where this impact will be. And I'm afraid that it will be gone 
<laughs> Thank you very much, which comes back to that question of should there be some legal obligation uh, in terms of what you do with the results. But Johannes, if I could come to you coming back on the recommendations that have emerged. Uh, Denise Cervantia asks, which topics were more prevalent? I mean, do we know how many people, uh, which recommendations were spoken about most by citizens? Uh, were there any data or stats in terms of where the conversation focused and, and indeed we know which ones passed the threshold you mentioned three didn't do we know by what margin are we do we have number of votes for each one or anything like that we do have uh, percentages um, unfortunately they're not yet included into uh, the recommendation document that um, was published but i believe as soon as the the panel report will come out we also know will know um, what what the level of support was for each of these um, recommendations, but the threshold was already pretty uh, pretty high. So all the recommendations that we see see now uh, received at least seventy percent of support um, among the panel. Otherwise, uh, with respect to what was most discussed, um, it's it's pretty difficult to say because the process only was tied together at the very at the very um, end, and a lot of the work. Um, uh, took place in working group in subgroups, um, uh, so uh, we would have ha have to be in in in, in um, all the subgroups at the same time to assess what was most prominent. What what you can you, what you can already see not only uh, within this panel but also in other panels that there there is a focus, for example, on improving education about EU matters um, on mm. um, on this or that topic um, about um, improving um, media freedom, um, media coverage, etc. Um, these um, these are recurring items um, that we could see in, in, in all the panels. But we wait to see that breakdown of, of the support. George, I want to come back uh, both on Elisa's comment about she's scared that it will, the recommendations will be brushed away. And Anya's question about would it be possible for decisions, uh, I think she's implying more in the future, but let's apply it now to be legally binding or have more legal weight that would demand a deliberate response from the institutions. I mean, you talked earlier about this feeling among citizens already that the process is being manipulated, they're not being listened to. How worried are you that these recommendations will end off being ignored because they don't fit uh, with what EU leaders are prepared to do. And, and Elisa mentioned some of the ways they would find out of it, to get out of it. How concerned are you? And as a plenary member, is there anything you can do to stop that happening? Well, I, for the recommendations to be legally binding, I think that would uh, require a very ambitious revision of the way in which uh, European decision making functions. Um, there is a, a crucial veto player in the joint presidency, and that is the Council. And we know that the Council, uh, from the beginning, has wanted this process to be as limited uh, in its ambition as possible. And uh, there is a, a, almost certainty that they will try to keep its ambition as low as can be uh, as we move to the stage of following up uh, from the citizen recommendations to actual policy decisions in the European Union. For example, some of its members have made clear that this is not a process about treaty revision, that treaty revision is out of the question. Um, and some have even went further than that and said that, you know, um, uh, as Lee, Lisa said, uh, many of these policies are already being formulated, so there's not much we can, we can uh, get from the citizens' proposal. I think what is important and what we one should strive for is for an institutionalization of a citizen deliberation element in the decision-making process, uh, at least by way of providing a feedback, at least by way of providing a citizen reaction to some of the proposals that have been that are being formulated in the European decision-making process, uh, and at least by way of putting some proposals on the agenda. We already have a precedent on that on the treaties. Uh, of citizens putting uh, an item on the agenda, it could be expanded to include citizens' panels if these are um, turned permanent after the conclusion of this conference. 
apologies, I had to mute briefly. I forgot to turn it back on. Max Stoyer uh, says, in connection with that, do you think it's important for the next stages of the conference and its legitimacy that European citizen panel members who are not ambassadors stay in contact with each other's and their ambassadors after session three? This links, I think, a bit to what Corinna said earlier. If so, should channels be created? So we don't leave them and say, thank you, you've done your work now, now go away. Corinna, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know how putting citizens in contact beyond this exercise will be uh, possible, given that they speak different languages and that it's already difficult for them within in the context of the conference to interact without simultaneous translation. So that is uh, an, a practical uh, obstacle uh, on the way. I also wanted to add to what George has said that um, um, with regard to um, making these proposals, these recommendations legally binding, I don't necessarily think it's a good idea also because uh, the process by which we got to these recommendations would need to be um, revised. Um, it was it was rather quick, it had its limitations, and, and I think that it would certainly benefit now of the exchange with the uh, with the officials and with the other uh, stakeholders and then citizens probably would uh, revise some of these recommendations and maybe at that stage that there should be a more binding element okay we're going to go but quite quick fire point. we're going to go quite quick fire now because there are a number of questions coming okay. in but Johannes you wanted to jump in yeah, just just on the point um, on getting citizens back together, um, it's interesting that exactly that point was also mentioned by citizens during the panel to meet again uh, beyond the feedback event that is planned anyway, but meet again in Florence or somewhere else to uh, to uh, um, exchange again on the recommendations. So there is also this need from citizens or this voice need from citizens. Um, on the other uh, on the other um, topic that I wanted to mention was um, how to ensure that the recommendations are not brushed away yeah. um, is that we need now to ensure in the process that follows, which is a political process, that the recommendations are properly translated into action, as, as George already said. And there, it is important that the proactive um, um, actors, the proactive institutions, uh, have a look beforehand or uh, in the yeah. working groups to see how can we make this work, how can we make this recommendation work in practice. Um, and the parliament, by the way, is already uh, preparing to do that, to make positions on all the recommendations to see how can we make them okay. make them so some people are taking that very seriously really quick answers are on a couple of things ruth murray henkers says uh, and this is to you i think elisa given the many problems some seemingly intentional she says in the process do you think there is a point where civil society should consider boycotting the process a link to that i see corinna shaking her head marin heller says cynical question would it have been better if classic politicians were not part of the debate, making them people's plenary sessions instead of the sequence of unsubstantial speeches. Very quickly on the should civil society boycott. Corinna, no, definitely not. What do you say, Elisa? Well, um, we had this discussion already in the convention, so I think that Ruth is taking putting this uh, also forward, not only to me, but also to the others. Um, my personal opinion is no, we shouldn't be boycotting because in the end of the day, I think that uh, it is important that civil society sees this whole process um, uh, completely to its full. There's not much we can do at the moment. We know what the challenges are and we know uh, what the weaknesses are. And I think that what we need to do now is try to get everyone's experience out of this yeah. And, and try to get some meaningful feedback in order to improve a For the possible future. process in the future. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, George, keep the politicians out of the plenaries, make them people's plenaries, get rid of this traditional EU format of doing things. <laughs> Again, Corinna shaking her head vigorously. George. Well, they, this is a very dangerous path. Uh, from the moment we believe that we have moved to a type of democracy that operates uh, through citizens uh, taking the decisions themselves directly and we don't need politicians, that's a very dangerous path. And the end of this path is Trump and uh, all the other demagogues and populists who are lambastic politicians for being a self-serving class. We need to, 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 in, to improve the process. We need to introduce more citizen participation, but we need politicians because democracies, our democracies operate upon the base of representative institutions. And that's how they manage to filter uh, emotions and passions and seek consensus and dialogue 
we live in plural societies with very different opposing interests. We need representative institutions to do this filtering job. So that really answers Andres Peterson's was asking, is this process a participatory democracy and does it not rival parliamentary democracy? You say, George, no. Uh, the two things can and must work together now and in the future, if I understand you correctly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Any other quick thoughts to that before we move on? Yes, Elisa. Yes, I, I absolutely agree on this. Uh, participatory democracy doesn't go against representative democracy. My expertise lies in digital democracy, which is more on the on the technical side. But I have to say that these two channels need to coexist. And I really hope that in the future, there will just be more, it would just be a normal democratic culture to have more participation in representative democracy. Citizens need to talk more to politicians, but also more to experts. And I hope that one day we will reach the process of co-creation of policies, citizens and policymakers together and not separately. And this is a stepping stone on that way. Alison Hunter linked to that says there were many unavoidable contradictions, she says in brackets, unavoidable contradictions in proposals from citizens. For example, federalism versus stronger member states, as well as clear signals with the best will in the world that some proposals could never work. Beyond the conference, looking forward, will the issues raised be used by EU policymakers to improve communication outreach to citizens? So Corinna, should the policymakers also be learning from this process, not just about how to design these sorts of fora better in the future, but also how they communicate, how they reach out to citizens. Absolutely. And this is also an observation that I made by reading the list of recommendations. I find very telling that this list um, uh, includes recommendations in which citizens, um, um, it's, it's obvious that they lack and crave more information and more interaction with the EU. So a good number of these proposals ask for the establishment of better and more communications and interaction channels for new ways of bringing people into the decision making loop and for helping them improve their awareness of what is happening at the EU level. And of course, it's not exactly surprising, also keeping in mind the experience of the panels itself, where it could quickly became very clear that citizens struggled uh, immensely with the uh, with EU affairs and knew very little about the topics that they were ask, being asked to contribute to. So I think in itself, that is something which requires further attention and reflection. And in response, I do think that the EU should come up with something far more original and far more effective than yet another communication strategy. Thank you. And Gisela Erler, going back to the question of the working groups, uh, about which you've all expressed a lot of concerns at the way they're working, how can Gisela ask the working groups arrive at true discussion between citizens and politicians? That seems key. So when we talk about this business of, and it was also asked in relation to plenaries, oh, you just leave the politicians out. But as George pointed out, that is not the point. The whole point is to have that conversation between the two of them. How can we make it work at every level of the conference? Any thoughts? Who would like to come in on, on that? Johannes. Mm. That is the key from everybody. That is the key question, yes. Yeah. And um, especially in the working group, we need this um, interaction um, between uh, um, uh, between citizens uh, on the one hand and, and politicians on the, on the other hand in a constructive way. That means we need deliberative um, elements in the working groups. The working group cannot just be another open forum where everyone makes their points um, completely unconnected. The, the working groups also need this deliberative logic, um, at least to some extent. Quick thoughts from others on that. George first, then Corinna, and then Lisa. Uh, I think we've, uh, as a matter of fact, the first thing uh, I would start from active presidencies. We need presidencies who do not just give the floor to successive speakers who have raised their hand, but actually moderate the discussion and act as facilitators. We need presidents like, I'm not saying this facetiously, Jackie, but presidents like you, you know, who can moderate the discussion by synthesizing the points, moving the discussion to, uh, to uh, further and building up uh, a kind of collective understanding on the issues. And as Elisa was saying, there are there are people who are experts in this. People do yeah. it. There are people whose job it is to facilitate, particularly citizens consultations. So there are people out there who know how to do it. Elisa, quick one if you would. 
Yes, I completely agree. I was actually going to propose you should be one of the moderators of these working <laughs> groups. Um, we've seen like um, MEPs or uh, commission institutional actors being the moderators. I don't think this is their role. They should be there debating with the citizens and there should be moderators as experts like yourself who knows how to synthesize, who knows how to take the citizens' ideas to have a debate. And let's not forget that democracy is all about the contrast of opinions. Yeah. And the fact that in a democracy, you there are different political parties always talking amongst each other to reach a compromise this is what the citizens also need in order to come to meaningful uh, deliberation. Yeah, you're all very kind, but I was in fact involved in the first European citizens consultations a long time ago now. And, and honestly, I watched people who really know how to facilitate citizens dialogues as opposed to panels. It's a different skill even to the one I have. Uh, it really is. It's a it's a it's a mastery. If you can you mention Corinna, the, the dots and the sticking, you know, colored stickers, explaining processes, making people feel they know what they're doing. It's a real skill. And I've seen it in action. And it's quite remarkable. Corinna, very quick thought to this, because I want to give George and Elisa a final word. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to defend the organizers, but just to say that I don't think that it's lack of knowledge or experience or expertise, but uh, it's n uh, knowing the theory and then putting it into practice, it's a completely different story, especially when you're working with structural constraints, which have been imposed by politicians and by compromises among institutions rather than by the organizers themselves. So just a caveat there. But um, beyond there, what I would say is that if we knew how to facilitate and to have perfect interaction between politicians and citizens, we wouldn't need this conference in the first place. This is why we've engaged with this process because we wanted to 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 um, uh, to narrow that gap that we've been you know uh, talking about for a long time between citizens and their representatives. We wanted to learn to speak to each other and to work together. And, and I think this is one of the reasons why we shouldn't. No, none none of the stakeholders should boycott this exercise. Okay. We should bear with it and we should take the lessons for the next time. Thank you. And just before I come to George and Lisa for a final word, I just want to say to Stefana Di Battisto, who uh, said she joined late and she wanted to watch the beginning of it. You can, information for all of you, uh, these sessions are put on YouTube channel and on the EPC website afterwards. So if you're so minded, you can watch it all again. Uh, but before we go, and I'm gonna to come to Elisa first and then to George, and I want to ask you a question I ask all our guests on conference conversations. And I want to go back to a quote from Commission Vice President Dubrava Suica uh, in March when she said, this conference will enable citizens from every corner of the European Union and from all backgrounds to share their ideas, hopes and dreams in shaping their union's future. As citizens now, not as representatives of civil society or, or academics think tankers, but for you as a citizen, Elisa, what is your biggest dream? Uh, to, let's move away from that paradise for cynics. Let's move away. Do you have a positive hope for the outcome of this process? Yes, definitely. I hope really that this will not be only just another lessons learned that we will just sweep under the carpet. But more than that, we will take all of the institution, all of the stakeholders in this process will actually take these lessons learned and continue to strive for more participatory democracy in the European Union that goes absolutely hand in hand with the representative democracy that we have. And that one day we will reach a democratic culture where all of this is just normalized. Mm. People constantly being called to be in representative samples, people constantly being in citizens panel, okay. and, but done in the right way with the correct solid process that I've been saying throughout this hour. Thank you so much, Elisa. George, do you have a dream? I, I would hope that this is an opportunity to mobilize citizens in a more permanent way. Uh, mm. Liberal democracies do not face the threat of oppression. Citizens are free to, to take the floor and to express their views. The challenge for liberal democracies is indifference of citizens. And that's how democracies die, when, when citizens retreat to the private sphere and allow demagogues to take the place of, uh, of represent of democratic politicians. And so I would hope that democracy takes too many evenings. Uh, that's one of its, of, its, of its shortcomings. But the benefit of more participation is that you end up with a richer public sphere where there is more space for everyone to be represented, to be better represented, to have a substantial voice. 
And in addition to that, I hope that the end of this process is a Europe that is stronger in the world, that has the ability to defend its interests and to promote its values in the world. And is not just a passive policy taker of decisions and actions taken by other superpowers or by regional powers that are authoritarian or aggressive or against Europe's interests and values. So I would hope this is my, my twin utopia, if you like, a richer democratic sphere with greater citizen participation and a stronger Europe at the end of this process. And on that uplifting note, uh, thank you to all of you very much. I wish we had another hour. Uh, so many fascinating things to discuss, so many issues covered. Thank you to you also for all your comments uh, and question. That is it for 2021 Conference Conversations, but we will be back in the new year as the conference gathers pace, as we move on what, under whatever timetable towards the end game, uh, we will be back and the observatory will of course be uh, picking up its activities and intensifying its work in parallel. I mentioned earlier, the high level advisory group uh, of the conference observatory is working on a first interim report that will be published early in the new year. Uh, and in the meantime, keep following the observatory on Twitter to stay up to date. And in the spirit of participatory democracy, as always, we will give you an opportunity in a moment to tell us what you think we should discuss in future conference conversations. But panel, thank you very much again. It only remains for me to wish everybody who I won't see again at another EPC event, maybe tomorrow. Uh, but if not, I wish you a very happy Christmas, a great new year, and I look forward to seeing you then. Bye-bye. Thanks.